so yeah, last year the summit focused on challenges. Now we've sat through a long day with a packed program focusing on opportunities. And some challenges as well kind of crept in there. Um, but with this closing session, let's try to synthesize, see what we can get out of this. Maybe formalize, for, formalize uh, uh, a policy recommendation or two. Um, and then before we send you off to Fostum, of course, and some cocktails. But let me introduce the people who will help me do this. Uh, so it's Hilary Carter from the Linux Foundation, Sachiko Muto from OFE and the Research Institutes of Sweden, Fredrik Svensson of uh, Red Pill Limpro, Andreas Gauger of Open Exchange, and here's the tricky one, <laughs> Michael <laughs> Maximilian or Max of IBM. So we'll get going straight away. Sachiko, in your view, what is an open source opportunity? All right. Um, well, first, let me just say that I think it was genius that you at least scheduled cocktails for after this session. So, you know, <laughs> we're in between you and the cocktails, but at least there are cocktails. So people are, are still here, some of, some of you at least. Um, OK, that's a, that's a nice little question, Astor. Um, I think, you know, we, and also your introduction to the session, because we had a little prep call or prep meeting before this, and I think we all started sort of striking out our, our notes, our speaking notes, because we realized that there would be no chance of providing any sort of fresh content at this point. But, you know, well, we'll see. Uh, I had planned to mention the study, which um, has been mentioned a few times already, so that should have been struck out. But talking about an opportunity, um, that's a really broad question, but I think it's about, you know, seeing that there's value in something, but then also that there's an un untapped potential. And I just sitting here today, I was thinking about, okay, let's, let's look at this automotive panel. That's gonna be really exciting as a sort of way to illustrate, you know, um, the, the opportunity for, for open source. And, and I really realized that, you know, it is both something that can illustrate a value that's already happening but also, indeed, um, the, the opportunity that's still there, because there are some challenges to still be, to sort of be overcome still. Um, I think, um, but about that, and, and really illustrating how sort of um, competitors can come together in a sector and really collaborate uh, and focus on sort of uh, innovate quickly and, 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 and focus the resources on sort of the top innovative layer. I think that's really, the opportunity. And we saw one sector, but there are, there are so many other sectors we can be talking about. And, and Hillary mentioned, you know, when we had that little conversation beforehand, sort of, you know, the, the entertainment industry, the, the movie industry, for example, the, the fashion industry, uh, you know, uh, and I think it opens some, some eyes here as well, because it kind of goes beyond what we are normally focusing on. So, and then really the opportunity it's for the public sector. I think this is something that we've been talking about for years. Um, it's about sort of it's it's time for the public sector to also benefit from 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 this way of innovating that's sort of already winning, I guess, in in you know in the industry. And so maybe we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on in the panel. Yeah, and Hillary, good, perfect segue. They they're mentioning Hillary. Um, Last year, you led the publication of the report, uh, The World of Open Source, Europe Spotlight 2022. With this analysis in mind, and what you've heard here today, um, what stands out for you as Europe's biggest open source opportunity? You can, of course, pick more than one. Indeed, and there are many. And thank you, Aster, and thank you, Sachiko, and everyone here, um, especially Open Forum Europe, for supporting our research and being a partner and allowing us to have a data-driven approach to how we view open source and the opportunity. And what I love about the research process is it identifies gaps, and so we have a chance to fill them. And that's why I'm so excited about where we can go from here. Excuse me. And one of the areas that our research identified um, was that Europe was not fully realizing the value of open source. In particular, certain sectors, certain countries lagging behind others, and most of the small and medium-sized enterprises were not taking advantage of the open source opportunity. Apart from the 
industry level collaboration and new industries that as they are becoming more um, software defined, they're capitalizing on the opportunity. But what I am most excited about is the possibility for the public sector, as Sachiko mentioned, to deliver citizen services at lower cost and be a model user of this technological gift, which is how we tend to see it. And when we can realize that vision and you know, COVID was a terrific example of here was a pressing need around uh, credentials and, and health or whether it's customs and border control or whether it's any other kind of citizen service. The opportunity to develop cost-effective, trusted digital solutions that create efficiencies and add so much value and allow Europe to get on with the business of innovating instead of waiting in long digital lineups or waiting for things that should be efficient but are not, that is the tremendous opportunity, whether it's a regulatory opportunity or a public sector opportunity. Uh, I think that's where Europe has the most to gain. Yeah. So businesses were mentioned, and so we're turning over to Frederick and Andreas. And Annoyingly enough, I'll give you a joint question, so you kind of will have to decide who answers first. Um, so, moving away from the innovation model itself and the opportunities that comes from that, what would you say is the state of the European open source industry? What opportunities do we see in terms of innovation, new jobs, economic growth, growing your companies? Is it a good time to be an open source uh, company? Wow, that's a large question, Astor. Uh, first of all, I would like to sort of summarize what's been said already today. There are lots of opportunities with, with open source software and open code. Uh, many of them have already been, been, been mentioned, but I would like to emphasize again that talking about di digital sovereignty, for instance, I would like to say, I would like, I'd like to think that open source is the solution to that. Uh, I mean, with open source, open code, you can choose how to deploy the software. You can make sure that you are GDPR compliant and all the stuff that comes with that. But furthermore, Open source also creates uh, an option to invest in software building, software creation uh, in Europe. And I also think it makes it possible to create a lively and productive uh, software community in Europe uh, that will enable both sort of uh, innovation today, but also future innovation. Because if investments in digitization, if they stay, that money stays in Europe, that creates a foundation for further investment and further innovation. And to your question, Astor, it is a good time to be an open source company in, 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 in Europe today. Uh, there is a lot of re uh, requests for, for competence and knowledge. And uh, as an open source system integrator company, we are making sure that if there is demand, there will also be supply for experienced and talented developers working with open source software. Yeah, I can only agree. It is much easier to attract talent if you have an open source background. So if you are on the positive side of karma, for sure. But we also shouldn't forget that there is large companies dominating big parts of this industry. And I, the only way I see how Europe can kind of get back on track and be competitive with that is open source like collaborating, um, openness, speed, innovation that comes out from open source. And, and the only things that break monopolies are governments, technical disruption, and open source. So, Max, yes. <laughs> now I'm trying to go through the full panel with annoyingly big and difficult questions. But um, so Frederick and Andreas talked about the business opportunities. Now let's pivot back to the technology. Um, what is the role of open source today, would you say, in the development of like tomorrow's technologies? You're involved in these things. Yes. So obviously a very broad question, as you said. I'll start by maybe um, quoting a famous European um, 
you know, who said that if he could only see further than most people, and it's because he was standing on the shoulders of giants. Um, he just happens to be on an island of Europe, but anyway, we all know Isaac Newton's famous quote. I think it sort of summarizes for me what open source brings, which is that it brings a foundation that you can build on top. And it's a foundation you don't want to recreate. So as an example of this, I'll give you three different examples, one in the past that I experienced, one in the present that I'm experiencing, and one I believe that's going to come or it's coming in the future. So in the past, um, a lot of you probably old enough to remember when USB or universal serial bus came about. So all those devices that you plug into your laptops, um, there was a time when uh, these were new. And in order for you to use most of those devices that would come, like cameras, m mice, etc., you had to have a driver. And you had to wait for the operating system that you were using to have the right driver, etc. And it would take time. You could buy a device and then you couldn't use it, like especially hard drives, for instance. And what I remember at the time, um, we were coming up at IBM with new devices and I needed to have those working on machines. And very quickly, we were able to build those because we built our solution on Linux. And why did that work is because we had access to the code, and Linux had an initial driver for USB, and you could come in and bring your own device and code the driver for USB. So this is an example of how open source allows you to create innovation very quickly. You don't have to wait for the next release of the operating system, which would, would usually take like two years before USB was available for it. So that's one example in the past. In the present, an example of this is cloud. If you're going to build anything related to cloud right now, it'd be foolish, almost crazy, to think that you could build your own stack. You just go and use what exists right now, which is a Linux Kubernetes stack. And it's a huge amount of code that works. It not only works, it works at scale. So if you're going to build something for the cloud, build on top of that. And then the last thing I'll mention is that now I'm, one of my mission is open quantum. If you want to play in that field, you want to start adding, you know, experiment with quantum computers, you're going to build it with an open stack, not only for the cloud, but also, for instance, with Qiskit, which is an open source toolkit built using Python, and then Chasm, which is an open source definition of how to actually talk to those quantum computers. So I think the basic thing is, if you think you're smart enough and you can build your own code and build it fast enough to release it in time, then I've added it. Or use what exists that works and is stable. So that's the future is open source. I just don't see any other way if you want to do it. Uh, in the time that we think. I mean, so, but then I'm thinking we're, we're here, at, it's an Open Forum Europe event, we have a panel. We're more or less concluded that open source is pretty good. But so I'm trying to think, not a great surprise That's the here. quote for, for, <laughs> from this event, right? Yeah. Open source, it's pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> but so let's uh, try to identify and get to like some policy changes needed. Like what can we do? And as I see it, and I'm trying to like summarize, well, kind of off the top of my head, but I've also taken some notes from today. Um, firstly, it will be important for us to safeguard uh, the innovation model and make sure that open source maintain, you know, stays frictionless, right? Secondly, there is policy aimed at uh, allowing the European open source software industry to grow. We will need that capacity, have that capacity in the industry to meet and realize these opportunities. And then thirdly, I think there is a need of policies or even regulation that lowers the barriers for open alternatives to compete. I think these are kind of three the main groupings of policy approaches if we're talking about, uh, um, uh, especially, let's say, the European Union and what could be done. But so, to make this a bit more concrete, and I'm, the questions are not gonna get easier, Andreas, if you were to advise a government, and I mean a national government, uh, how, um, they should approach creating a national strategy for open source. And this is for a nation, 
not a city, not a uh, company, not an industry, the country. How should they go about it? What should the goals be? Oh, that's an easy question. <laughs> <laughs> so I would say, first of all, you know, I think one of the main goals for any government should be that data sovereignty is actually happening. And so the opposite of sovereignty is dependency. So first thing I would say is make sure that all the important parts of your infrastructure are not depending on one single whatever company or something, right? It should be inter interchangeable. There should be minimum two options for anything so that you can kind of move on, decide, and not dependent. If something goes wrong, if one of the things doesn't work anymore, there should be another thing that can replace it. And then secondly, make, especially for smaller companies, and, and open source companies tend to be smaller than, than the big ones, right? There are some exceptions. Um, make a, a stable playing field. Decide for standards. Don't create standards. Decide for existing ones, right? Uh, only in the, if you can't do other, create one, but there's plenty there. So decide for standards, cement them that people can rely on them, building stuff based on them, and also force anyone in the market to support them. And then thirdly, don't only listen to companies <laughs> or, <laughs> or organizations. There is two uh, groups you should also talk to. And the first and the most important one is developers, right? Developers can easily tell you if a standard or anything you want to do regarding to your infrastructure makes sense or not. Much more direct and much more easy than any kind of like people that have an agenda, uh, and typically companies tend to, be, tend to have a very strong agenda, so not a good source for information. And also users, you know, once you have built something and you're proud of it, be only proud of it if the users that have to use it are happy with it. It's also very seldomly done, <laughs> especially before release, so yeah. I think these little three rules would be super helpful. I know it's very pragmatic, but I'm a pragmatic guy. Yeah, Frederick? Yeah, okay, if, I, if I may add to that, I think um, trying to raise it up a level, as you said, Astor, we have concluded that open source is pretty good. So I would say if I was a, a, a country or a national agency or even the EU, I would implement a policy that says that you should always evaluate open source projects or software before you make a purchasing decision. And if there is a viable open source project out there, always choose that. And thirdly, all publicly financed or funded development should always be open source. And you should be able to reuse it for other organizations that are also public. And I think it's on the fifth on my list now. Uh, create a space where all the publicly funded development can be shared with others. So those are five bullets that I would like to send with uh, uh, and include in the national or EU policy. And then lastly, make it easy to buy services related to open source software. So create like a framework agreement that are either influenced by open source or where you include vendors that can help you with open source based solutions and services. That makes it easy for public sector organizations primarily to, op to use and to buy services related to open source. I think those things would make it easier for public sector organizations within the EU to buy and use open source software and related services. Hillary, looks like you want to say something. I would only add, this is a phenomenalist, Frederick, I would add if I were advising government, and although I'm from Canada, I have Irish citizenship, so I would approach government of Ireland first and foremost, is requiring um, open source development skills training earlier in the education system so that Europe has a workforce uh, that is skilled for the digital economy, for the open source software infrastructure. Because as it, uh, my colleague would say, and I heard Gail Blundell from Eclipse Foundation saying, we have to raise our um, skills and our communities and our, our talent pools. We cannot hire our way out of the digital transformation imperative. 
we must raise the skill level uh, among our citizens. So I would add that educational component uh, as being baseline and start earlier. And I feel, didn't the Deputy Prime Minister say that uh, 2023 is the year of skills? Let's add it. Yeah. But Sachiko, I see you want to say something, but I'll formulate it as a question and then you can take it as you want. I'll say whatever I, I exactly. was planning to say anyway. Yes, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's a, and this is also Andreas, as an organization with an agenda. So if we, I hope you will listen to some of the information that we have to say as OFE. And Sachiko, you know OFE really well. We have worked for 20 years uh, to level the playing field for open source alternatives, but here we are still. How would you say, uh, what is the state of play for like, the, the alternatives? The, is the playing field level? So this is when I, okay. So, well, 20 years, you said. I've been there for, for, for 15 of those years. And you know, to some extent, you know, it's clear that things have, a lot of things have changed, right? And so, um, and at OFE has also come a long way. And Astor, um, congratulations on, on the event, I think. It's, been really great, Paula, of course, also, but uh, and the rest of the team. But I think that you know that's a reflection also of how, how far you know open source has come, and we have kind of grown alongside of that. But I think one thing that hasn't changed, you know, um, open source is eating the world. Open source has won all of that. Um, but it struck me that one conversation where we haven't moved uh, very much is actually on procurement. And you didn't say, you know, you didn't use the words procurement, but that's what you're, what you're talking about. And I think this has been, it's, an, it's, I really think that we need to make some progress there. But at the same time, I don't know if I want to say that we haven't made progress because indeed you t we, we heard from the deputy prime minister and after that in the public sector panel, actually some important practical, you know, projects uh, that are moving forward. And I think it's important there that, that we sort of, you know, what they said also in that panel, like, let's, let's build on each other's experience. Let's um, sort of share between governments experiences and things like that. And I think I'm hoping, you know, you had an ambitious list there. Um, I do hope that the Interoperable Europe Act, which introduces some it's not just words, because that was one thing that was also deplored, I think, by some, some speakers in, uh, in previous panels, that you know, we've had some very positive de ministerial declarations. You know, like there's the Tallinn Declaration, there's the Berlin Declaration, you know, all these declarations and where it's easier to just to celebrate, like, oh, now it's going to be like open by default or something like that. All the ministers have signed. Um, you know, it's... it's um, the Interoperable Europe Act does propose some specific sort of first structures, but also things like an agenda, you know, an Interoperable Europe agenda, where we're going to hopefully see at the European level, um, uh, you know, a listing of priorities of the sort of the type of interoperable uh, e-government solutions that are needed. And even it proposes the possibility of developing some of these technologies at the European level. And I f really foresee, like, if this could work like that, you know, opportunities also for, for um, European SMEs to work at, at sort of the regional or local le or national level to sort of help uh, governments um, further develop and, and, uh, and customize those shared solutions. And then also being able to sort of bring that back to to, to Europe, um, yeah. So I mean, not sure that answered the question, but it was more or less what I wanted to say. So. <laughs> and here, uh, Max, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Yeah. Um, simply following Andreas's recommendation, we should talk more to the developers. Um, what do you think? Uh, what is your take then? Any reactions on the things that are coming in from very much the developers' point of view? What are, what would you be looking for? Yeah. So. Uh, I guess as a developer, the thing I would tell people is that, well, two, two things. So first is building software is hard. Um, what I mean by this is you can all build very trivial piece of software, right? It's, you know, everybody goes to a class, you take a class, you can build stuff, you know, simple things. Uh, but that doesn't matter, right? Building large piece of software is very hard and building it so that it scales is even harder. What do I mean by this? 
if you just go by the fact that the code has to be written, sort of like a language you're writing a novel, and you have to type it, right? So you think, okay, let's say we're going to build, you know, uh, a cloud software, and you think, okay, how how much code is that? Something like Kubernetes is in the millions of lines of code, and it scales, and that's why. So if you were to build it with a team. Imagine how long it would just take to type, and that's not even a team that knows what they're doing, just to type it. You can see how long it would take. Now that's just to create it. Once you have the software created, it has to scale. So you now have to think about how do you scale it. And that's just the beginning of it, because you also have to maintain it. So as developers, there's a series of things you have to do. And maintenance is dealing with security, like what the previous panel was talking about. And those things come up all the time. So as a developer, that's what we need, right? Is, is the whole life cycle is dealing with the creation, the getting it to work so it's correct, testing it, then scaling it, then it's in the public hand and you have to essentially now maintain it. All of that takes time. When you're in a community, when you have a community around the software, such as in open source, it makes, a lot, it makes it a lot easier to deal with all these steps. And I think that's the key, is that as developers, building that community, being part of a community helps. And open source makes it much better than if you have it in private organization. I've worked in both, and I can tell you it's a lot more fun, less stress, and a lot easier to, um, to have a community. And the last thing I will say is that, I hate to tell you this, um, there are usually smarter people that are not working in your organization. Except for in our organization. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's just the way it is. And I've seen it repeated over and over again. And they come from all over the world. So, you know, when you have open source, you can hopefully tap into that. But then it feels like I'm trying to, like, we've everyone seems to have come back in one way or another to this kind of skills competence, like having a skilled workforce question. And I'm going to see if I can force that into the last question here, and then it will be open up for reactions. But so Andreas and Frederick, I'll start with you again, because I do talk quite often to open source entrepreneurs, business owners, etc. And um, my earlier question was quite leading about like how is it to be because uh, be an open source entrepreneur today, because when I talk to them, they're very busy. Uh, there is quite some demand, and uh, you know, meeting the demand is a challenge, but it's there. Um, and for the kind of opportunities and the promises that we have listed here today, we would need quite a lot to meet those. So. Can the industry meet this promise, this demand? Are you ready? Yeah, I've chat GPT, so they will do all the <laughs> development for me. I, I, I heard, I guess, I don't know. <clears throat> no, it's difficult, certainly. But I, I think if you are a smaller company and you have a positive karma, open source agenda, it's much more easy to find people than for large companies with maybe a negative karma agenda. So, so there, this is not our major problem. Our major problem is still that it's quite tricky to make money with open source. I know we are all growing and it works somehow, but it's trickier, much trickier than just being the only one who can supply it and putting a price tag on it. If you innovate, there's people that download it and just use it. Do, right? do you mean that it's a lot easier to kind of have a monopoly position than being exposed to a lot of competition? <laughs> a monopoly position is um, the easiest there is, right? <clears throat> but, but also, you know, you can create a product and, and build, you're, you're innovative, you have an innovative product, and you are the only one who is supplying it, it's much easier to make money with it than you have an open source project, or you make it open source, and then there's a whole ecosystem that uses it for free, and there's other companies that use it, that they make even money with it. It's just more difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's more difficult. So that is something 
all open source companies think about day in, day out. I can promise you that. Yeah, it sounds like open source companies are exposed to a lot of competition. But usually exactly. you're pretty good. Frederick. Yeah, from my perspective, I'm representing an open source uh, solutions provider or systems integrator. And as from my perspective, open source has always attracted top talent. So we have really skilled people working for us. And of course, they can share their skills with uh, ambitious and eager people to learn. So I think that's one way of approaching the issue, uh, making sure that we have a program to sort of skill up people and to uh, further expand the workforce that way. Uh, another way we do uh, uh, that we do here in Europe is that we cooperate, cooperate with our peers. There are other companies. My company is based out of Scandinavia. We have other companies based out of Germany, France, and so forth. And, and we do have a co collaboration with them. So we collaborate and we learn from each other. And uh, if we need to scale a project in Scandinavia, I know who to turn to. And I'm hoping that my peers in France and Germany also know that they can turn to me for assistance if they need to scale up for projects. Is there uh, uh, any kind of public policy, legal framework, or something that could improve and help and increase that collaboration? This is, yeah, really putting you on the spot here. Yeah, the, no matter, but I think I have an answer to that. I think I also mentioned that. I mean, um, it would make our life easier if there was like a framework agreement in place or that made it easier for public sector organizations uh, to start with when they want to purchase services related to open source software. Definitely. So if, you, if there is a framework agreement in place that is either influenced by uh, the willingness to use open source software or even implies that you need uh, to use open source software, that would make it easier for public sector organizations to purchase the services they require. Well, it's good. It's, I'm thinking, like, you know, reading the, the archives of OFE over the last 20 years. In some ways, everything is different and in some ways, everything is still the same. So it's good. So I have French, a, yeah, 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 and I have things to do for the next coming years. It seems like we haven't solved everything, but just uh, I'm thinking now. I'm just improvising here, but just some last words from each one of you, and make them positive and energetic, so we have something inspiring to talk about during the the uh, the cocktail. Hillary, first, that's easy. Uh, thank you. My favorite idea is this notion of leadership and who will lead us to where we need to go. Who is a special person from an industry, from a non-governmental organization? Who will rally the leaders and the change makers? Uh, because I think m my theory of digital transformation is one of leadership, that it comes down to people who are willing to take a career bet and have the courage of their convictions and that's what I think is going to be the magical formula that helps build out the open source opportunity in Europe. Such so no preparation, just asking me to be upbeat. You know, <laughs> there are a couple of people said that they are half. Was it <laughs> glass half full? And then Katharina, she said she's an optimistic person. Um, I think it. Like I said, I, I, I think there are some very positive messages today. I think we should go back and listen to the, to the opening sort of keynote as well, because I think there are a lot of, a lot of good things in, in there. Um, I didn't have a chance to get back to you on the skills thing. I think it is important, and I think it's important to some of the things that came out of here is that you know, the developers, the top talent, they, want, they prefer to work on open source. Uh, and I think that's important for Europe uh, if we want to... to attract and keep the top talent. Uh, I think it was Mirko that said, you know, open source reduces redundant effort. You know, nobody wants to be doing redundant effort, you know. And I think, Max, you, you kind of elaborated on this a lot, and I think that's really powerful. And, you know, I think often in Europe we talk also about not wanting to be, like, we, wanted to, we want to be at, at the cutting edge. And really, that's what, you know, open source... Um, provides the opportunity for. And often we see 27 replications. <laughs> so, <laughs> Frederick? Yes, so this panel is about the opportunities with open source, and there are many opportunities, of course, but I think my favorite one is to use open source to fuel a lively and productive uh, software creation community in Europe. Let's make sure that tech innovation happens here, all, both now but also in the future. And I think that's the sort of main opportunity for us living in Europe with open source. 
Thank you for taking mine away. <clears throat> so, so, uh, humans are successful <laughs> <laughs> because they collaborate, right? Uh, uh, that, that is one of the main reasons why they are so, so successful. And um, open source is a very successful form of collaboration, right? Like worldwide, diverse, no borders. Do you think there's a better, ex anything that w is actually better than open source when it comes to collaboration? I don't think so. So we are spearheading the future of humanity. Let's say it like that. <laughs> How do I follow this? <laughs> well, maybe I'll give, I'll add to it by giving you uh, some very specific examples. So the last work that I did, uh, now I'm engaging into open quantum, but the last work that I did was in Knative, which is a layer on top of Kubernetes to make it serverless. So that started uh, at Google, and I believe Google in Seattle, uh, mostly American engineers. Uh, then various groups started being involved, especially Red Hat, um, in Germany, uh, then more folks from the US, but there's also quite a bit of collaboration right before the pandemic from China. We had lots of engineers in China adding to it. Um, and then now you have folks from uh, Japan doing big contribution to it, and then also more of the rest of Europe. So in other words, exactly what you said is that it's a human endeavor. And I'm seeing more and more contribution coming also from different parts of the world that you haven't seen in the past, like for instance from Africa. And that's the beauty of open source, is that it opens it up uh, from the rest of the world. And you get people that are contributing from places that you would never expect because they want to use it. And we have a Slack channel and there are people responding and you have GitHub issues that you can open and people can discuss. So really, the only thing you need to kind of know is to be able to speak English a little bit, and that's it. Yeah, and I guess that's you, all. We, we all know that top talent is out there and often not in the groups that you think it's going to be exactly. in. Exactly. They're just all over the place. But then I guess also just now, of course, I'm hijacking the end here because I'm the session leader. But um, I want to thank all of you for joining, but before I get off stage, because I know that I'm keeping you from going to the cocktail, I really want to thank uh, the OFE team for putting everything and all of this together, and especially Paula, before I get off stage, who <laughs> spent eight hours or something like that moderating. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for joining. And now, I think Paula has some final words, and then um, I'll meet you out there for a drink. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Aster. Thank you, everyone. I was really thinking what to say at the end. I took so many notes, but to be honest, just this quote, we are spearheading the future of humanity. I think this is a good start for the cocktails. Um, but having said that, thank you very much for coming. Thank you to all the speakers for sharing your insights with us. I think we have a lot of food for thought. Uh, I hope that you're coming to FOSDEM. Uh, take a look especially at the legal and policy track. We will be there just hanging out, so uh, let's see each other. Uh, but I want to say thank you to OFE team, to the tech team here on site. Uh, yeah, you hosted us very well. Um, and I hope to see you next year, probably in a larger group. Let's see, let's see how we do it and for how long. See you there and enjoy the cocktail. <laughs>